Hello, everybody. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that I am sitting in San Francisco on the unceded ancestral lands of the Ramatush Ohlone, who have never forgotten or abandoned their responsibilities as protectors of this land. And I hope to continue to learn from their example. I'm going to turn it over to Alexis, who has made some time with us today um, to talk about keeping our accounts safe. Um, and thank you very much, Alexis. We really appreciate having you here. And I'm excited uh, to learn some more. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Um, this is something that I haven't done in a little while, as I told Kate before. So I'm excited to actually do this training today. I am Alexis Hancock. I am the Director of Engineering at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So what do I do? What does that mean? Um, I manage open source code projects um, at the EFF at the moment. I have been for the past year. I've been at EFF for about four years. It's an organization that's about 30 years old, a little over. And the open source projects that I manage are about encrypting the web or securing the web and securing your web traffic in particular. Uh, I also research internet security issues and problems and policy, be it domestic or international. I help create security education materials. So I often update a lot of our materials on our SSD guide. And I also um, give security trainings from time to time like today. So this will be exciting. So EFF's mission is to ensure that technology supports freedom, justice, and innovation for all people of the world. What does that mean? So we generally have a arm of technology, technologists, activists, and we also have lawyers. So we come together as like that three prong attack onto anything that endangers our digital liberties online. And we often work together um, in different groups and teams to make sure that we are hitting things on all fronts. So whether it be legal, technologically, or if we need to do some sort of an activism campaign to create awareness of some kind. So we have a lot of open source projects actually. I managed two of these at the two top on the left side, HTTPS everywhere and the little guy with the key is CertBot. There's other projects that we have like Surveillance Self-Defense which has a lot of materials. Uh, Atlas of Surveillance tells you about different technology um, that different police departments around the country may be using in your area. Privacy Badger which helps prevent trackers from following you around online. And even other tools like Cover Your Tracks that helps you kind of understand the footprint that your browser leaves and many others. So I'm here to talk about protecting your accounts, right? So I'm going to use a lot of terms and jargon, but with passwords and multi-factor authentication, this is something that a lot of people describe as a password plus something you know, plus something you are, or something you have. I don't generally like to use those analogies because things kind of get mixed up in the meaning of what that could be. So I try to say that a password is behind the first door of authenticating you to a email or other account like your social media accounts. And behind a second door would be the second factor. And both of these things cannot be behind the same door in order to be considered multi-factor factor authentication. So if your password's in the same place as this second factor, that would be considered just behind one door, wouldn't it? And it wouldn't provide as much protection as something behind a second door. And I will describe a lot of these things to you on like different ways of what that second factor could look like, plus a password. The reason why this is happening is because if you probably already know that a lot of companies have a lot of data breaches, and a lot of it can be surrounding the fact that your passwords could leak um, in these data breaches. And if you have particular sets of passwords that are shared among accounts, uh, attackers can do something called credential stuffing where they will take the same password that they found leaked somewhere else and try to log in with a different service that you may have with the same password and kind of try different accounts you have. So that's why multi-factor authentication is great because even if someone had leaked your password or a company had a data breach, 
that attacker or hacker or, or anybody that is maliciously trying to get into your account would need that second factor in order to actually get into your account. So it wouldn't really matter if they had your password. So that's why this is um, offering that amount of protection. MFA is not new. There's new ways to do it. But some of you may have worked for corporations before where you had to have like a little token on your keychain where it was like a six digit rotation that you had to like log in with in order to actually get into a system. So if you remember those, um, this is pretty much like the newer implications of that. You likely already do 2FA. And I, I say ATMs and PIN codes are kind of like what your introduction could be for 2FA. A lot of the times in order to extract cash from an ATM, you need to know the PIN code. A person can't just have your card and walk up to an ATM, stick it in and get money. They need to know the PIN code. So that's kind of like a form of two-factor authentication because you have something, your card, and you know something, your PIN code. So that would be a preliminary uh, precedent for 2FA in your life if you need some sort of like understanding on how to like apply this to online accounts. Uh, so I'll go with this in levels. So level one, um, for multi-factor authentication, certain accounts out there, say um, your bank account, um, may ask you, do you want a code texted to you in your settings or something like that, or a code emailed to you in order to log into your account? So that may have happened to you before in different ways. I'm using a bank account as an example. So that would be called a one-time temporary token or pass. Um, code or number that's sent to you. Um, it's the easiest level of 2FA to use. Um, it's dependent though on network, obviously, because if something's being sent to you, it's either dependent on your cellular network to give you that text message, or it's dependent on some sort of like Wi-Fi or network to actually um, send that email to you. So you do have to wait between that time of being able to connect to some sort of cellular data network or um, Wi-Fi or cellular SMS or text message um, to be sent to you in that code. So what will happen is you'll log in, you'll put in your password, and then the service will ask you for that second code that was either emailed or texted. And I usually introduce people to this level because it's the easiest to use, it's the easiest to onboard when you're thinking about second factor authentication. There's some implications with this um, that a lot of people don't consider this the best method of 2FA or the most secure, but I often tell people if this is what, this is what you're most comfortable with using at first, go ahead and try it out. Um, it's whatever you can get comfortable with first and you can always level up later. Um, as you get comfortable with one method, you can bump it up to level two or level three, as I will discuss. Level two is something called a time-based one-time password or TOTP. I try my best to stay out of security alphabet soup, but unfortunately it will happen from time to time. There's a lot of acronyms in security, I apologize. Uh, TOTP or time-based one-time passwords. Um, usually, um, you'll use a third party application that you have to download on either your Android based phone or your Apple iOS based phone um, that they will ask you. These applications could be Google Authenticator or some other free authenticator app that the, the service will ask you to download. Most likely, they'll provide a link if you do this route. Um, and what happens is you scan in usually a QR code on your phone from the services to scan this in on the app, and the app will pick it up. And then you will see these six digit codes pop up with the name of your account associated with it. You can change the name in the app for your own recognition if need be, but usually there's a um, name just associated with the service. Say, um, you know, Chase Bank uh, or something like that in these example accounts. And you'll see these six digit codes um, that the service will ask you. So usually what ends up happening is these codes change around every 30 seconds. So that's why it's time-based and only one time. And they keep going for every 30 seconds. And so even though the setup may be a little bit more complicated, what's better is that this is offline. You don't need to have a network connection to wait for someone to send something to you. And there's no registration needed beyond that um, or sharing of personal information anyway, like your phone number. 
with the service, you can just download this app. The service um, will ask you, like say your email um, to scan the QR code and all of this is offline information. It's, and it's just time-based, it's based off math in the background on confirming this code. Once you log in, you'll put in your password and you'll put in the six digit code. Now don't be, get too scared about the fact that when it 30 seconds is up and then it changes, sometimes you can't enter in because there is some lag between the 30 second intervals. Um, so don't feel like you're, you have to race. And if you have to put in the next one, you just have to put in the next one. I use this a lot in my own settings um, as a good backup. And once you do this method, they'll likely ask you to download a set of backup codes, which I'll get into later. Um, but I just wanted to kind of just focus in this aspect for, for now on the level two. So level three, security keys. Um, so the most popular brands of security keys are YubiKey and Google's Nitro Key. What are these things? So I have one here. Oh no, the, let me put it in front of me. Here we go. So this is security key. Um, you put it into your laptop or computer usually. Um, there's different other capabilities that these guys provide, like even in your phone, you can tap it to your phone. That's called NFC or near field communication. Um, but mostly you would plug it in to the USB ports that you see on your computer once you log in. So the, the most popular brands, like I said, are YubiKey, which is what I have. I have a whole bunch here. <laughs> I have four or five of these things. I really love them. Um, they're not new. Um, they're, these guys are new, but um, security keys are the ancestors, or not the ancestors, but the, the offspring of something called hardware security modules that you probably saw in corporations, maybe, where it had to stay plugged into a certain machine and there was like a whole ceremony behind it. But now there's way cheaper um, HSMs. That's what I call them. Uh, that exists now for your own use to authenticate and log in. Um, the good part of these things are that they're on your person. You don't have to open up your phone in order to actually use this. There's no extra app needed for this. You just register it with the service when you um, opt for a multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication in the system in the settings. Likely it will be behind security settings. Uh, a lot of um, online accounts have been better about splitting up between security and privacy settings. So when you turn on multi-factor authentication or go to it, um, you'll have that. I'll share a link as well with Kate that helps you find if your service has 2FA for easier um, navigation. Um, so no, ex no extra app needed. Um, interaction with the key is only needed in order to log in. So there's this like, let's put it here. It's like this little circle, it'll light up usually when you plug it in, when you're logging in. And there's a whole system, I'm not gonna get into the, the, the math and the magic behind it, but it's something called FIDO2. It's an open protocol that's newer and works with these. So what ends up happening is if you plug it into the USB um, port into your laptop and you've registered the key with that service, what will end up happening is um, this will light up, this little circle, at least with UV keys. I don't know how Google Nitro does it, but I imagine they have a similar mechanism. And you tap it after you, and so you log in, you put in your password and it'll say, hey, tap this guy, tap, and then you'll be logged in. Um, the good thing about these keys are that everything that's on the key that's supposed to be private stays on the key. It doesn't leave it. No one's cracked these and it's very tough to crack them. And um, it would take years usually computationally. So that's why this is considered like the most secure method in terms of using these. Um, you could do a short or long tap uh, that's for like different situations, but you should just tap it when it lights up. And then even so with phones now, you can take your phone if, they, if you have it registered somehow and uh, with an account on your phone, you can tap and usually the NFC um, sensor to tap is usually in the upper part of the phone, not the bottom part, at least I, on the Android phones that I've used. It may be a little different on iOS, but usually I've, I've seen the NFC sensor be somewhere towards the top. 
especially if you're paying with your phone or something like that, you usually have to navigate it towards the top. That's what an NFC sensor is in, in the device. Um, it's nice to mix with other MFA methods. So if you're not quite comfortable just yet using this alone, and if the service offers different ways to like, like I said, with the time, one time, um, time-based passwords or passcodes, you can mix these two, register a key, have an authenticator app. So that way you don't have to be regulated to just one. Um, not every service does this, but when it can, it's really nice because I, I use a mixture of both with a couple things and you can have that, you know, mixture of security if you want. And you can always, and, and yes, there is the possibility you could lose these, which is why I like to mix it with other MFA methods. But usually I keep it on my person. Um, like I said, I have like a little keychain here that I have. I always have to keep my keys on me. I don't take these anywhere, obviously. Um, I usually keep these uh, by my work desk somehow. They're usually hanging up on the side. I take it, I plug in, I tap. Some people just leave it in. You know, they just leave it in the, the USB port as needed because there's no communication otherwise besides logging in. And it's a nice, you know, it's nice to have. The only drawback is they do cost money. They are not free. Um, the cheapest ones I've seen are around $25, but there are programs and things out there that help people get them for free, um, especially if you consider the high risk individual, like you're in a domestic violence situation, possibly and stuff like that. There's different programs that give people security keys in order to um, protect them. I think Google has a program, but the cheapest ones I've seen are $25 um, that provide that simple authentication mechanism that you need. And also, you know, they last forever. I've had the same YubiKey for a long time. They're not meant to die so to speak. So once you get one, it's, 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 it's pretty much, you know, very long-term. I've, I've never actually met anyone yet that said their YubiKey died. I've never, you know, came across that. So they're meant to last a long time. I, I think at least for 10 years, if I'm not, if I'm mistaken. So with that said, they come in different sizes. I have the pictures down here, but the one on the left is usually the typical piece. And they, they have different ports, like it's USB ports. There's other types of ports on your phone, like USB-C like the little symmetrical ports. And there's different, you know, they, they have different ones that have with different computers, like even lightning ports on Mac books and things of that nature. But um, usually a USB port is available on most laptops and, and computers. So that's why I talked about that one in particular. Um, this is a little demo um, of using a security key. So GitHub is a um, service that I use an account that I have for all my code that I have from all my little public code projects and also um, for the open source projects that I manage. So I need a high level of security. And so what ends up happening is I have my key in the USB port, I use it, I tap it, and then it logs me in. Um, and this is after I've registered the security key in my settings. So this is what kind of happens each time. And if I don't wanna use a security key, say I'm, I'm not at my desk and I just have my phone, you'll see a little option of don't have your security key, enter your two-factor code from your phone or recovery code. So there's different methods of actually being able to navigate this. So I said I was going to talk about backup codes that usually happens when you turn on to FA of some kind or MFA of some kind on your accounts. So remember the, the principle of two doors, um, usually with the backup codes, because it'll usually just be a text file that they'll give you or something to copy and paste. And so what I usually do is I copy that text file and I put it on an external drive. If you're feeling fancy, encrypt that drive if you know how. But um, I usually put that behind a second door because I don't want, say, my backup codes in the same account that could be compromised. So if the user gets past it for some reason, a password or something like that, and I have 2FA turned on and they somehow bypass that, which they probably won't, but you just don't want it behind the same door. That's basically what I'm trying to get at is that save it on external drive or USB drive, uh, print them out, save them in, in a locked drawer. You can do that. I know a lot of people make fun of those who put their passwords on post-it notes, but at the same time, physical security can help in this case where you can just print them out and save them somewhere um, hidden away because attackers can't, unless they're breaking into your house, they can't see these backup codes. So there's that piece or keep them in some other secure method. Some people have gone so far as put them in a little safe. Um, 
you know, you don't have to go that far, but just keep them in behind a second door, you know, and, or possibly as a secure note in your password manager, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So speaking of password managers, we have a lot more accounts than 20 years ago online. So I've seen a lot of security trainings, people, you know, kind of get reprimanded for having the same password for 10, 20, 30 accounts, but it gets hard um, to have all these accounts now and not have some sort of way to actually log into them all. So we have a lot more accounts now than ever. Um, data breaches though are common. And so if someone accessed your password from another account and was able to log into the other 30, that can be problematic. As you can mention, the identity theft scope could be much more impactful than it used to be because of all these accounts, much more information online. But there's a way to, to protect yourself from the next breach. And so 2FA was the first part of that. The password managers can be the second part of that. And so I'll go through the levels with password managers. So level one could be your browser. So a browser could be your Chrome browser. You could be using Firefox. Some maybe be using Microsoft Edge or what you may think to have with Internet Explorer. Explorer. Microsoft Edge is the rebranded modern Internet Explorer for Microsoft. So if you need to associate those two, that's what that is. But basically any browser, a modern browser usually keeps some sort of method or way to save your passwords. Um, the, the, but the basics of this is that there's no extra needed apps. It syncs across devices if you're logged in with a Google account, say, and you're a Chrome browser, or if you're logged in with a Firefox account or something like that. And it will provide a way of simple setup to actually, you know, save the passwords. So it'll have simple mechanisms like generating a password for you maybe and saving them to one spot and even maybe exporting your accounts or deleting them. So what ends up happening there is there's no real other security controls besides the security controls you have on that account um, that's saving the passwords, right? So that's level one though. And if you just needed a simple way to like onboard yourself on how to save different types of passwords without having to really think about it, that could be one way. Um, as far as, you know, level two, there's something called standalone password managers. This is different software you would need or download, but it's the best part about password managers that they are usually available across different platforms, your phone and your computer, they can be synced. Um, they have strong protections against compromise because usually when you set up these accounts, you have to set up a master password in order to log in. So really you just need to remember one password, set a strong one password. And then what ends up happening is it will log in and fill in the username and password for you that you saved. Um, just like a, the typical normal browser password would, but with a bit more protection. Um, password managers end up having a lot more security features and controls than just browser password managers. There are security features that alert you to a breach sometimes. Um, I've actually seen someone be protected from a phishing attack online. They had they shared their story where they had saved their password and their username and their password manager for a particular website. And what ends up happening is these password managers will normally remember the website it was on, detect and say, hey, you want us to autofill? But when this person went to a certain website that he thought he was on, the password manager didn't pop up and say he wanted to autofill. So he thought it was a problem with the password manager. Turns out it was a phishing link. And the phishing link wasn't the exact website URL match that the password manager knew for that account. So he was actually about to put in his credentials on a similar phishing site um, link and was actually about to give his credentials away to, to a particular party that he had no idea um, was asking for his credentials. He thought it was the, the validated service, but since the password manager's website URL detection didn't, didn't see it for the username and password, it actually ended up protecting him against phishing. So there's capabilities against that. Uh, there are free and paid options. Um, there's also other features saying like, hey, your password's two or three years old, or this password was detected in a breach, or you know, these are the accounts you have with weaker passwords versus stronger. And you can kind of manage from there. 
but a lot of them do offer a uh, 2FA setup, but I also talk about the, the two door principle. If you have your second factor in the same place as the passwords, I don't really consider that 2FA or MFA because it's behind the same door once again, but that feature is there in some of them. And here's a little GIF in the corner, kind of simulating what it would be like to make a new password um, on a site, because usually there'll be an extension you can put into your browser for that password manager. You can have standalone software that you reference. And that way everything can work together. Your phone will have an app likely for that password manager. And you can also use it to log into apps on your phone. So don't worry too much about the fact that you wouldn't be able to access this password manager everywhere because you usually typically can. And the, this is, takes the most overhead of setup, I think, out of all the things that I've said today. But if you sit down and you take the time to learn like which you know, password manager is right for you and take some time and set it aside, you'll be able to you know, get yourself a lot of protection for 20 minutes and save yourself a lot of grief down the road. So this is a short list of password managers. Um, one is called KeyPass XE. It takes a little bit more individual setup than the others um, because you'll be a bit more responsible for the database that it generates and everything and generating that password and keeping everything will kind of be like on that one device usually. Um, you can try to sync databases with that, but I tend not to recommend this for first timers, but more so for experience, more experienced users. Um, the other free versions, well, non free versions, but sign up required would be 1Password. I personally use 1Password um, because it's been the most, uh, I would say, convenient out of the password managers I've used in the past. And the only drawback with 1Password that there is a subscription fee a month. They used to have a free version. It's disappointing that they don't anymore. Um, but that one in particular has been very convenient to use and very helpful. It's just, it's a shame that there's no free version anymore. There are other free versions um, of different password managers like Remember and LastPass. These are other two pro, um, password manager softwares that you can get for free. You also have to have sign up required, but for the most part, they, they take you through these steps of not just setting a master password, but needing a key to in order to register on different devices and stuff like that in order to kind of help you make sure that even if you, if someone found out your master password, they wouldn't know that key. And usually what ends up happening, at least with one password, you'll they will download that key, save it somewhere on a PDF. Like I said, two door printable, keep that somewhere safe, print it out if you need to, and maybe not save it at all on your computer and store it in a drawer. But you just need to know that master key as well as that master password usually. Pick a strong master password. It will be the only one you'll need to know. So it will be, um, something to do when you sit down and actually set up a passphrase, like I usually a couple of random words with spaces in it that are kind of long. Um, that's actually pretty decent for a passphrase, especially if it's like four or five words that are just random. Uh, we actually have a, let me try to like bring it up. So EFF.org DICE helps you generate passwords for yourself. And uh, it's really kind of cool. And like, and it explains all that. So I'll put this in the link on like what, how to choose a strong passphrase for yourself. So there's that piece. So I have some tips for transition to 2FA and password managers. So you start, you know, with your email for 2FA. I usually tell people, a lot of us have Gmail and maybe some other services as well, maybe even Yahoo, but most of the major email providers offer 2FA now. So I would say go in your security settings in your account and kind of check it out from there. But uh, oh yeah, I said I would share um, the 2FA link that we had to see if your account has it in the first place. Let me see 2FA directory. Uh, I think this is it. Yep, there it is. There we go. So this is um, a site you can go to to see if your account needs 2FA or has it or supports it. Um, you can start with password managers, not start with password manager and not the password. I tell people when you talk about password managers, 
it can be a little daunting, but at the same time, don't worry about if your passwords are weak right now or not. Just go kind of onboard yourself with the password manager, get familiar. Um, I do not have the demo for that for now, for today, because I'm running low on time. But at the same time, when you do get set up, usually what ends up happening, you sign up for an account, they'll give you the tools needed for um, setting up a master password. They'll walk you through the whole situation. And what ends up happening from there is that you'll see later if you have weak passwords for, or not. But don't worry so much about the state of your passwords now. Don't feel bad if you have multiple passwords for different accounts. Starting with the password ma manager and choosing better passwords going forward for different accounts that you create in the future helps create more digital health for yourself. Um, so don't worry too much about your previous habits and what you may have. And if you even if you don't have it all together, if you just like utilize one or two tools, it helps you against breaches in the future. Um, another website that I tell people to go to is um, HTTPS, have I been pwned.com. You can put in your email there and it can tell you if, whether or not your email was in, in one of the public breaches that were disclosed by companies. So you'll likely see your email pop up in some breaches probably older than others. And I say, don't panic, don't worry. I put my email in here and I get breach notifications of something that happened in 2013 or an old account from 2016. And you can do an assessment on like, wow, was that a really important account? Or was that an, an account that was just kind of like, you know, a newsletter that you signed up for of some kind, right? So you'll likely see something associated with the account because data breaches, unfortunately, are very common. Um, and then from there, you can kind of assess like, okay, how often has my email been impacted by all of this? And so you can assess for yourself or whether or not, um, like what kind of security measures you would need for yourself going forward as far as like establishing 2FA, which will help prevent, you know, this type of thing happening to you in the future of having your passwords, even if your passwords were leaked, you would have extra protection on your account. And most of these breaches are updated very often on this site. The guy behind the site, I've met him, is very dedicated to making sure that people are up to date um, and being able to see, you know, whether or not their their accounts were involved in some sort of like public breach. But if you have 2FA turned on your accounts, like I said, this wouldn't, you know, be much of an issue going forward. So that's why I tell people kind of assess what's going on with you right now, what you're comfortable with. Um, what level you think you want to go for and just kind of get started from there. Don't worry about necessarily your old habits, but these are some of the tools that I use to tell people to get onboarded. And if, you know, the 2FA.directory URL that I posted can help you kind of see kind of what services and banks do I use that offer 2FA. Not all banks, banks are kind of behind. Um, so I, I hate to use them as an example, but emails definitely um, and other social media accounts usually, like Facebook offers 2FA, Twitter offers 2FA. Um, you know, so if you have social media accounts in, in, in that way, um, you usually have 2FA available to you. Um, banks, I think for the most part, they offer, you know, texting a code to you or text or emailing a code to you of some kind. They're usually behind on the security uptake sometimes, which is unfortunate. So those are the things that I have put out there. Um, I'm hoping that we got into a good place with this. Thank you for listening. Um, hoping that I can clarify any issues or comments. But if you do have questions in the future, don't worry, just email me. You know, Alexis, you, you talked about this and it went over my head. Or Alexis, you talked about this. I'm trying to get set up, but it's not working. Um, I will gladly help you. Just send me screenshots or information and I'll try my best to actually help you. I do respond to my emails. Um, I check my junk folder often in case things went there. So, because I get, you know, questions all the time in my inbox, I'm, I'm very open to chat. So thank that you so much for listening. Nice. Alexis, thank you so much. This is the real deal. Um, and I think you may be getting some emails. So I appreciate you. Again, thank you so much. It's, I, it's exciting to have this level of detail. Um, and I, I appreciate you for that, but I think people have some follow-ups. So I'm gonna try to go in um, sort of order received, but a lot of them were from, earlier sections. And um, so starting with Frank, uh, Frank, you wanted to see again how to set something up. 
whose various apps and websites only offer you certain options. You can't just do it yourself. Frank, do you want to unmute and tell us a little bit more about what you were looking for there? Yeah, I mean, this was early on in the presentation, but basically, like, you know, I find that, like, if I go to a specific website, it will say, do you want to use two-factor or you need to get this passcode, but it's not necessarily like where I have options on that website. I'm kind of, my experience has been, I'm kind of beholden to what they offer. So my question is, is there a way to do beyond what they're just offering up or will you kind of get just stuck with what they give you? That's a good question. Trust me, we've been pushing people to try to adopt 2FA wholesale on online accounts. Not everyone offers them, especially people who probably need to, um, especially sensitive services. Um, you are sort of beholden to whatever they offer in their systems because they have to build it into their system in order to authenticate you um, first. So you have to, some will offer just pin codes. Some will offer um, the time-based one-time passcode services where you can, where I showed with like the app on your phone. Um, some will offer even for you to register your security keys, but unfortunately not everyone has that mixture or, or, or those options. Um, so you are beholden normally to what they give. What you can do though, as a customer is bug them about it. They, people listen to customers. I promise from time to time, especially if you, if it's a sensitive service and say, Hey, I noticed you don't offer 2FA or multi-factor authentication. Why not? This is a sensitive service. And this is important to not, you know, have my passwords. If, if my passwords are leaked, I wouldn't have any protection because you aren't offering any, that's important. And so I would say like even bug them. A lot of Twitter brands and emails uh, actually listen to people when they tweet at them. So there's that piece. Uh, so yeah, there's unfortunately not widely, as widely adopted. It's much more than it used to be, but hopefully um, that link that I sent with 2FA um, dot directory will help you see what is out there and what they offer. Um, it can be filtered by country if you're for some reason for, uh, hailing from another country uh, or need to share with relatives and family without outside your country. They can you can filter it by country and their services that are more popular there than the U.S. So I try not to um, offer just U.S. centric services and um, directories. So good question, very good question. Thank you. Does this work for a desktop computer? I think that was two FA as well. Marcia, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I just you know I just wondered you you can't use QR codes and things like that obviously when you're on a desktop computer. Um, and also, some of us do not use those mobile machines when we are sitting at home, uh, not mobile. So, you know, um, want something that's just totally um, useful on, on the computer. I mean, two-factor authentication drive, you know, drives, would drive me nuts on things that I go into all the time, you know, pass a payroll service and things like that, um, because it just, uh, it just requires taking extra time when I'm just going in and out and in and out for things. Yeah, that's a good point. MFA can be a little cumbersome, especially if you're not used to it or if you just try to get in and out of the service. So for your PC in particular, uh, what I tell people usually is that there's different, like Windows and Mac OS, they offer different mechanisms. I do not have the, the implications off the top of my head. I do know you can you know, log in with a pin code or log in with your fingerprint. And that's kind of, can, can, you know, a log in with some sort of scan or something like that. Um, I wish their MFA options were a little bit more intuitive for people, uh, but they, it is possible to log into your PC with 2FA. As far as like not using your mobile device altogether um, and just using your PC at home. And, and if you're not really into the smartphone way like that, I know a lot of people that who don't have smartphones at all. Um, I know people who, um, you know, much rather not have that much information on their smartphone. And I completely get that because you can lose your phone very easily, right? You can break your phone, things of that nature, and you change phones a lot. Um, there is ways to export the 2FA codes off your phone if you're using that app to another phone. But if you're not really into using the smartphone device, I usually tell people, you know, opt for security keys, maybe for your accounts online. There's a lot of options to stay logged in so to speak, when you're in these um, different accounts, especially if you're using the same browser usually and you logged in 
and you don't have it set to where it just wipes everything once you close the browser, it usually let continues the session with you unless you need to, some, some of them will prompt, hey, could you just tap the key again just to make sure it knows you, the session's been ongoing for a little while. Um, but I usually tell them because this is offline, this doesn't need an extra app, this doesn't need um, anything. Not all services offer registration with security keys, unfortunately. But if it does, I would say kind of offer this. Also, um, you know, even if you don't use use a smartphone, say um, on a regular basis, um, if you just have an, like an older one or something like that, then you could probably just use it just for your authentication codes. If you like that method, you can. But I usually tell people just offer security keys or use the level one aspect that I told you about, like pin code to your email or just one that texts you. If you don't want all those apps on your phone, you have to navigate all of that. Um, so a mixture of level one and level three might help you or just using security keys might help you. There's different ways to do MFA. And I, like I said, I wish it was a little bit more widespread among services, but those are some of the offline ways you can kind of like log in with different methods and different ways of multi-factor. Um, as far as the PC itself, you might not want to do that each, each and every time. Um, but as far as like 2FA on your accounts and everything, there's ways and methods to do that offline that don't necessarily have to use that with your phone in particular, or, um, you know, and then this is usually the method I tell people um, if it's available to you. AH, who I met earlier, has some questions about uh, suggestions for password managers that are Android and Windows friendly. And I, we talked about KeePass already. Um, AH, do you want to unmute? Do you still have that question? Uh, my you did mention KeePass XC, which um, is a fork of KeePass, which I'm currently using. So I just hopped over to their website to take a closer look at it. So I think um, pretty good on that front. Um, are there other ones you would suggest that do have, I guess, the ability to share, um, like Bitwarden, for example? I know I've got a family plan on that one as well. Um, mm, yeah, yeah, family plans. Um... One password has a family plan, as far as I know. I believe LastPass has one, but I do know for a fact one password has a family plan. There's ways to share in one password. They call them vaults. Right. So you can have like a family vault um, to share among yourselves in the password manager. And then you can have your own vault. So there is methods of that. Any um I didn't mean to cut you off there. I think you said something else. Oh no, 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 no. No. Okay. Okay, um, but yeah, there are other friend when password is pretty friendly. I use that. I've used that across multiple different operating systems together, Mac OS, Windows, Android. I know people use, on, use it on um, iPhone. And then there's the web extensions you can install in Chrome and Firefox and even Microsoft Edge, I believe. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, is NFC affected by magnets? Good question. So maybe a really powerful magnet, so to speak. So sensors can be damaged mostly by other electric waves, electromagnetic um, waves, say, you know, EMPs are like some sort of EMP signal, but it has to be a very strong one in order to fry your phone. And if that happened in your area, it would be multiple phones. But as far as magnets themselves, it depends on the materials. I think the NFC sensor is based off of, which I do not know off the top of my head, unfortunately. I'm a hardware enthusiast, but I am not a hardware expert. I do study the aspects of phones and the different sensors they may hold, but I do not know the alloys involved in making these sensors in particular, but I do know they're all radio-based normally. So anything that can interfere with radio-based waves can usually impact that, right? Or electromagnetic waves can impact these sensors. And then on top of that, NFC is meant to work within 10 centimeters, which is why it's considered more safer because in order to actually interfere with that um, near frequency communication, you need to be very close to it. Um, otherwise you're out of range anyway. So if something is happening over here, it probably will impact my NFC sensor because I'm only going out 10 centimeters in order to actually do that, which is why paying with your phone or the end of, you'll see it, um, there's like an NFC based or RFID based chip in your uh, credit cards and bank cards, debit cards now, where you can tap the card. That's meant to only really be within that 10 centimeter range. And, and it maxes out there and in order to prevent things like people being able to craft devices to interfere with NFC and somehow uh, take your bank information that way. So they specifically made that protocol to only work within that really short range. Thank you. 
Are there free programs for security keys that you can provide additional information about? Yeah, um, let me try to like search for them now. Sorry for not having like this link up, but there are um, free programs. So I do know Google ran one for around for a while. So free security keys. I'm pretty sure it'll be one of the first things that I pop up here. Um, Titan security key. I know Google gave away 10,000 to high risk users. I'll find that program. That'll be my to-do list. Um, but I do know there's different ones that give away these things free. And I'll even talk to, um, I do have a little bit of connections. So if you do need a security key and you're a high risk user of some way, in some way, um, probably can like, a, like get you in contact with someone possibly to get one. But at the same time, I, I do think there's programs out there the cheapest ones I've seen are 25 bucks, but I know people are working on different types. I just pose the ones that have no known issues with them. Um, so that way I can, you know, provide the safest options available out there for you. But there are other ones that people have been creating, but YubiKey and Google's Titan Key is usually the ones that I've recommended because those are the most accessible, popular. They have different, YubiKey definitely because it, 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 it has different ports. So I'll have one here for USB port and I have one here for USB-C, the little symmetrical ports that phones and different devices come with now. But I'll, I'll, that'll be my to-do list. Thank you. Um, if you. If you lose, this is from Marina, if you lose your security, what does one do? Contact the company you register it with. Marina, do you wanna say anything else about that? Um, hello, this is Marina. I was just wondering what, what you need to do in case you lose it. Um, your security key misplace the security key mm -hmm. or you have it on your keychain uh, and let's say your purse is stolen and all sorts of scenarios where you can lose it what is the first thing you need to do thank you okay um so this is interesting so my toddler ran off my ub key one day and i couldn't find <laughs> them for like two days um so that was actually my uh, <laughs> initial aspect i didn't expect her to to go on my desk and actually like take them and run off somewhere with them. So what did I do when I found out my UV keys were missing? I was like trying to find out where did she store them. Turns out they were in her her um they were in her picnic basket that she plays with. But it took two days to find that. And so what I ended up having to do. So one, a lot of the same accounts that offer security key registration, if they're that good, they normally offer backup key backup codes. Um, most 2FA methods, when you turn them on, will offer you backup codes. So I was still able to access my account. Um, say I have my purse stolen. So that's even more of uh, a dire situation because you're probably not going to get it back. Um, so usually at, what ends up happening, you can do inventory is, okay, which accounts had the security key registered to? Um, it may be many, maybe not much. I actually do not have a lot of accounts with a security key registered because of the fact that not many offer, unfortunately, the security key registration. So what ends up happening is I log in with my backup codes, but the, the backup codes I was talking about earlier that usually gets generated when you turn this feature on your account, the security feature on. And so I went and I logged in with the backup code. So I didn't need the security key, thankfully. And you can deregister the key. And so that way, if your purse was stolen, say it was a targeted attack, Say you are a really important person, you're a senior VP somewhere, and someone stole your purse knowing security keys were in there. You would be able to log into your account, deregister that key, so that key won't be able to get re-registered with your account unless you do it. Um, you can set up another 2FA method, like the, the time-based one-time tokens, possibly, or some other security method, like emailing you a pin code or something in the meantime, or while you get a new security key to register. And that, that key that was stolen will be defunct. It won't work anymore because you deregistered it. So that's kind of the process you would probably take if it was stolen or lost. Great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And then there were some questions about like purchasing um, a security key, but also like, you know, if there was a question, like if you buy it, will somebody give you a demo? Like, how do you? like how to put it in like physically like how do you kind of yeah yeah that bridge? um so there's different um maybe that'll be something else that I can do as my to-do list like there's there's different um educational material out there on how to register the stuff 
Um, so let me like put that down. Um, there's YouTube, there is a YouTube video, I think Yubico, uh, the Yubi Keys uh, manufacturer has. They have a lot of educational content because they really want people to use this. So they didn't want, they didn't just make this and, and, and then expect the people to onboard themselves. They have a lot of educational content actually on how to use Yubi Keys from highly technical people to people who don't know what security keys are. But it's usually really simplistic to register. Usually you would say, I want to turn on 2FA. And usually the flow is, what type of 2FA do you want? And if they're offering security keys, they say, hey, register a security key. I'll plug in. And then it's like, hey, we detected it because this will light up. And then you tap and it'll register. And then you'll be done. So all you have to do when next time you log in, just do that tap. A question from Bonnie, could you explain two door again? Yeah, yeah. It was the metaphor for um, 2FA because the typical explanation for multi-factor authentication is something you know, something you are, or something you have. And I think that can get really mixed up on what that means for people. So I transferred it to something else in my own analogy that I've created over time in my security trainings is the two-door um, uh, principle. If your password and your second factor via security code or pin code is behind that same door, then it's not 2FA. So my security key is something I have, and then my password is something I know. So I'm mixing those two pieces together to be 2FA. And um, you can't get my password behind the same door I have my security key. My password's in the company's database, and my security key's with me. So that's what I mean by like two door principle um, and keeping that principle going forward on what does it mean to have 2FA and not really mixing up the whole something you know, something you are, something you have, because something you have could be your thumbprint, but it's also something that could be potentially exploited later for biometrics and stuff like that that someone could store. I don't want to get into that too much. Um, I tend to stay away from the biometrics aspects of all this because it has privacy implications. Um, so I usually talk about pin codes, one-time passwords, and security keys. So that's what I meant by the two-door principle. Hopefully that clarifies that some. Sorry. Um, this question is dear to my heart. Please comment on saving passwords on your personal Google account. Every time I use a password on my laptop at home, Google asks me to save the password on that PC. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of levels of trust here that, you know, that obviously go into saving your passwords on like Chrome, the Google browser. It's really up to the user, I tell them. If, it, if you don't use a password manager at all, you're kind of apprehensive to use a password manager because you may not want to go that in a level yet. Saving your password somewhere is, is for the most part, you know, a decent first step, but you may not want to save them necessarily with your Google account. Now, there's different threat levels. If you feel like the government, for some reason, will ask for your sets of passwords accounts and you're a high level, high risk user for whatever reason, and you feel like law enforcement may get involved one day with your accounts for whatever reason, be it something you did, something you didn't do, um, that could be a little complex because Google does give information over to law enforcement in particular. But that threat models for a very specific set in time. Um, as far as like you in particular, setting 2FA on your Google account, if you're saving passwords to your Google account, is pretty important. Um, because you don't want your Google account to get compromised or your Gmail account, so to speak, to get compromised and then maybe have access to your passwords that were saved to that account. So if you're going to do something like that, please turn on 2FA so that way your passwords have a level of protection because when you're doing browser level saving, when you're saving these passwords on the browser, you need some sort of extra level of protection there, um, especially if your accounts are syncing from different devices and things like that. Um, I definitely tell people to turn on 2FA as like the, the first step if you're doing a browser, browser level password manager. Uh, could you comment on the concern that putting all passwords in a password manager is putting all your eggs in one basket? Good question. So essentially when you're using the same password across different devices, that's also putting your eggs in the same basket. That's what I tell people usually. So with password managers in particular, you are ensuring a different set of trust with them saying that I expect you to keep my password safe and encrypted or you know secure in this arena and you're having it all stored in one spot. So, but 
but the different accounts that are associated with the password manager don't know the passwords for all the other accounts that you have in the password manager. It only interacts that one time with the account that needs it, right? So you are logging into your email and your password manager pops up like, hey, you can fill this for your email, you fill it in, and then you go about your day. That account isn't associated with all the other passwords um, that were generated from the password manager because it doesn't know those passwords. Um, so I don't really consider it putting all your eggs in one basket in particular. I consider it actually putting another level of safety on your passwords that would have probably had less safety if you didn't have a pa password manager. Because if you are using the same password for say 10 or so accounts even, that's, that's also putting a lot of eggs in one basket if a data breach occurs. And then that same person that got the one password from one account can pivot to all the other nine. So that's usually uh, my response to that type of question, but it is a good question because you are entrusting a certain level of confidence in these password managers. And I would say that most of the, the, the ones on the market like 1Password and LastPass do offer um, a assistant amount of security and a very open and transparent if something does occur with the password manager software. Um, but I haven't heard of any breaches of any kind with them in particular. They're very good about keeping things safe because they know what's at stake. If, People lose trust in their password manager completely and not never use them again. And that would be their product and they'll go bankrupt. So there's that. Yeah, that's high stakes. Yeah, um, high stakes. Are there any free open source password managers available? The KeyPass X XC is open source. Cool, cool. All right. We're getting we're getting down in it. Thank you again. A question: how do I set up 2FA access on my PC? So there's different ways and methods to do that. Um, you're probably thinking, if I'm thinking about the right context is logging into your account on your PC. If you have Windows, usually Microsoft offers like to log in with like say a pin code or a password. And I actually log into my PC with my security key. Um, usually the, it's not as intuitive to set up on your PCs normally, but I do know logging in with your account, your password is usually one method and the 2FA associated with that account, say your Apple account or the 2FA associated with your Microsoft account can be utilized to log into your PC or it could be standalone, I believe. Windows is a little finicky. <laughs> I have a lot of problems sometimes with Windows. I have problems with all operating systems, but Windows have been very annoying when it comes down to some certain things like that. So if you go and you log into your computer, there are different ways. On my work machine, I actually have a second password that I use to decrypt my, you know, my device before I actually log in. Um, but that's a different subject for a different day. Full disk encryption is a whole other set, set of uh, uh, slides and presentations to explain. But um, I usually tell people to go for that usually before I even like go into the 2FA stuff. But it is possible with your PC. Uh, sort of a question about how password managers work. When you log into a password manager, does it then automatically fill in the password in, in apps? Yeah. Um, so you may be talking about mobile. And yes, um, usually what ends up happening is, um, actually, let me just show my phone, probably my bank account here. I promise not to show anything sensitive. But um, OK, so here's my, uh, that's a little too bright. But my Chase account, you know, it will maybe, mm, that doesn't do it. My Chase account um, in particular will pop up. You can't quite see that, but usually I'll tap into login field. And what happens is one password will pop a prompt here in my keyboard. And then um, I'll tap it and say, hey, look, Chase. And so it'll ask for my master password here. And I'll type my master password here. And what ends up happening is once that goes through, it will autofill the username and password for me. And then I can log into my app on my phone. So that's usually what happens, at least with one password. I think other password managers use similar tactics. Um, but usually if you go to your app and you log in, you press a field, it'll usually pop up a prompt and you'll usually see it like, hey, do you want to autofill this? And you put in your master password, username and password will, will fill in for you. Thank you. All right, you guys, we've kept uh, Alexis over time. One last question. Do you recommend we allow an app website to remember our username so it auto-populates? I think um, 
username mem remembrance is okay uh, for the most part. I do tell people to usually try to pick unique usernames for different sites. So password managers help manage that a little bit better. But as far as um, having the username and remember, just remember your threat model for yourself. Do you want other people to see it on that device? Because if you save it on say a public library computer, you might not want to save anything on there. Um, but if you end up actually um, having your personal laptop and, or your personal PC where you don't really you know, exchange with a lot of other people on that device. Sometimes it's okay to, you know, have that auto populate. You can always clear it if you're not comfortable. The browser usually offers to clear history, cookies, and filled in information. Um, so you can go in your browser settings and wipe everything if you, you're, you're starting to become uncomfortable. So you can always backtrack that. Hi, I, I, I have a question still about the, the two door um issue so on um, the first example that you gave for the i think it was the two-factor authentication where you get a text message with the code um and you i think you said that that is one door it's not yes. really a two door so how is that one door and how do you get it to be two door okay so the first door is always the password um where your password store and a second door is that second factor. And so you mentioned SMS or texting. So that's the second door in particular. So, or my second door could be the security key or the one-time based password. So the first door is always where the password is, which is usually with the, the, the company's database. Um, so that's something that will be the, behind that first door. You don't want the second factor to be in the same place like the company's database. So usually the second factor is usually something you have, know, or are, or somewhere else that's not in the same place as the password. So I use that as this kind of a principle for two-factor two authentication to think about where you're storing things more than the methods being used themselves. Like where are things stored and are they stored in the same place? So the pin code will be the second factor to your text message because your password is in one place, which is the company's database, and the second door would be the SMS text message that you got with the bin code. So that is two doors. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Alexis, thank you so much. Um, this has been really informative, a lot of information to help us understand the issue and see what we might wanna do ourselves. Alexis, thank you so much for being here, being part of SF Tech Week. Thanks everybody. Bye everyone.